the praise. He's worthy of all praise and glory. We lift him up. You are God, and we lift you up. Keep singing, keep praising. We won't stop. Give it all we got. You're worthy of all glory. Oh, there is no wonder. You are forever. Lord, over all, nobody like you, no one beside you. We sing to you. Let the endless praise resound every night and day. No delay. Endless praise resound. Yeah. We came to give them all the praise and glory. Boundless love, like before the sun, your glory, eternal, never stops, giving all you got, creation, keep seeing, oh, there is no other, you are forever, Lord, over all, nobody like you, no one beside you. for us while we were yet sinners he came and he found us and we give him all the praise they lifted him up against the sky and now we lift him up high on his throne we sing we lift you up 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 we're giving you a love 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 for everything you've done 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 we give you all the praise we lift you up we lift you up Love, love, love For everything you've done, done, done We give you all the praise To you, to you Let the endless praise reside Every night and day No delay Endless praise Every night and day, no delay, endless praise reside. Yeah. So we come together this morning, we give them all the worship and all the praise, and the thanks for everything he's done and everything he's about to do. <laughs> Amen. Praise the Lord. Count on one thing, the same God that never fails will not fail me now. You won't fail me now in the waiting. The same God who's never late is working all things out. He's working all things out. Yes, I will. Lift you high in the lowest valley. Yes, I will bless your name. Oh, yes, I will sing for joy when my heart is heavy. Oh, my days. Oh, yes, I will. Same God that never fails will not fail me now. You won't fail me now in the waiting. The same God who's never late is working all things out. Is working.
our hearts continue burning. This is our prayer this morning. For our King is soon returning. Yes, he is. As we hold to this assurance, Spirit come, Spirit, Spirit come, Spirit come, Spirit come, and pour it out. Let your love run on, and here and now, let your glory, Lord, let your glory be. Pour it out, pour it out. Let your love flow right now. Let your glory fill this time. As we lift our voice and our hearts and we sing, tongues of fire, testifying of the sun. One desire, spirit come, spirit come. Thank God. What a joy it is to be able to join together in one accord, lift our attention to heaven, begin to invite the Spirit of God. How many know that our great need, whatever that might be, however that's expressed, is met by the Spirit of God coming. Amen. I was speaking to a brother in prayer this morning, and he was just talking about coming to a point in his life where he realized, I can't do this. It has to be God. God has to get involved. And the beautiful thing is that when we gather together, Jesus said, I'm there. Amen. He sends his spirit to, we're going to call upon heaven. We want to believe God and just ask God for his grace as we do open in prayer. We want to remember uh, Raymond Cordova. He's back in the hospital and uh, we want to pray God just intervent intervention there. We want to continue to pray for Tim Martin wound care as he's in Dubai right now that God would just uh, overshadow and help him and bring healing. Deborah Mason sister her name is Becky has had a stroke and she's recovering but still having seizures needs God's grace. Uh, I want to pray for the nation you know, I was reading Daniel chapter 9 just yesterday, and I, it's his intercession for his nation was so powerful. I mean, he just began to pour out his heart, and God visited him and released grace. And I believe if there was ever a need for intercession, it's in the day and hour that we live for God's people to pray for their leaders, to pray for their community, for their nation, that God would have his way and pour out his spirit. Let's believe God for that. How many here? 
here, you say, you know what, Pastor, I have a need. Uh, I want to believe God. We're, and amen. God hears. He knows. Uh, he knows the, the requests of those who petition him. Uh, maybe uh, our brother John Scheidt, you would come and seal this for us in prayer. But let's pray out together. Let's pray for one another. Let's pray for God's spirit to have right away. Blessing on Pastor Garrett as he ministers. Amen. Father God, we pray your Holy Spirit. Invade our lives, invade our midst, touch us. Father God, we thank you, Lord Jesus. We thank you for your word, Lord. We thank you, God, for all that you're going to do this morning. Father, we lift up these needs before you, God, believing you, our great physician. Lord, we pray for Brother Tim, God, overshadowing, and we speak healing upon his body in the name of Jesus. Uh, we thank you, Lord God, for Pastor Garrett and the message he's going to bring this morning. I pray your anointing upon him. God, take the word, Lord, by your Holy Spirit and meet every need. Uh, we lift up those who are not who do not know you, Jesus, uh, that you would bring conviction, that you would uh, bring a wonderful drawing to the altar of repentance today. We thank you. We give you praise. Uh, we love you, Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Tell someone you're glad to see them as you're being seated. Good morning. We want to welcome everyone to our Sunday morning worship service here at Door Church. Those of you participating with us uh, via live stream, we welcome you. I know uh, that there are people uh, around the world who uh, they know more than I do. Hallelujah. But they are uh, very much uh, interested in and supporting all that God is doing. I bring a good report got back from Las Vegas, New Mexico, and their Bible conference, uh, Pastor Gabe's uh, home turf, and uh, outstanding time. Uh, one great uh, announcement, uh, not only an international church plant, but a nation that we have no presence in prior to this uh, announcement, which is a church being planted in Tirana, in the nation of Albania, and uh, uh, it was such, uh, it was one of those divine coincidences because uh, Sister Naomi Makastad accompanied Dr. Hamilton and a few others on a recent medical trip to uh, Albania, uh, brought back uh, a testimony and a report and uh, people uh, contacts, and then here, Pastor Ruby, totally uh, separate from that, is praying about uh, open doors of opportunity and uh, their burden for Albania and those things uh, meshing. It's a wonderful thing when God gives us uh, a true open door into the nations of the world. I want to uh, just uh, use that as a segue because as the ushers are going to come in a few moments, uh, one of the opportunities, and I believe it to be a genuine open door, that God has given us is in uh, the nation of India. Uh, Pastor Evangelist Larry Beauregard has been uh, uh, very heavily involved uh, in uh, reaching and uh, partnering. And I use that word specifically because all that we do in world evangelism is based on a partnership. It's what Paul wrote to the Philippian church in Philippians 4. He said, as you know, you Philippians were the only ones who gave me financial help or Others say partnered with me when I first brought you the good news and then traveled on from Macedonia. No other church did this. Even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent help more than once. I don't say this because I want a gift from you. Rather, I want you to receive a reward for your kindness and uh, uh, through uh, relationships uh, 
uh, very real uh, contacts, uh, primarily with uh, Pastor David Coda, his brother John Knox Coda. Uh, Larry and I sat in the office, uh, and there on the uh, uh, screen were able uh, to speak to them, uh, uh, and uh, that's one of the blessings of Zoom. We could sit down, communicate about what God is doing, and in a couple of weeks, uh, uh, Larry is uh, going and is going to be preaching in six uh, different cities, but uh, maybe if he's here, he should come real quick. I don't know uh, where. Uh, uh, come and just tell me, uh, because I can't and didn't write down the names. You grab a microphone there of all the cities. Uh, And so he's, uh, this itinerary is quite extensive, so uh, I think it's worth. So um, I leave on the 5th of October, and uh, we're going to go in. Two of these are villages, and the other two are cities. There's an average of 200 pastors per location. Uh, the reason that we're going where we're going is because we've had pastors coming from these areas. Not only that, but I'm going into a safe place that I can minister without getting arrested. And so uh, they're under threat all the time. And so going into Ganpur, uh, uh, beginning there on the 11th, and then uh, Antantapur on the 15th of October, and then traveling to Gunter and be there on the 19th, and each time we're doing two days ministers meetings, one day youth rally, and then uh, Raja Mandri will be there, and this is all with the people that speak Telugu. There's about three or four different states involved in this, and uh, pastors that are going into the jungle areas, uh, to tribes that are in the jungle of India that's not even connected to the rest of the nation. Wadakar and his family came uh, during the conference in June, uh, we're believing God they'll be moving to Tucson soon, but he's got a church of 150 to 200 people in Mumbai, and we've gone there and done conferences. We're going to be doing another conference there. He speaks a totally different language than David and John Knox. And then his cousin, Josh, Joshua, that's in a, a city called Ta Downed, uh, he's got about 400 people in his church, a church building, everything. These are all untouchables that are moving with God and have been their whole life given to God and they live under the threat of their life being taken. They're beating up preachers all across India right now. The Hindus are very, very emboldened to get rid of Christianity. And so they are laboring, faithful, and we're going in laying foundation, knitting the hearts of these pastors together because there's hundreds of thousands of pastors in villages they're not connected to anybody. They don't have any pastoral friends. We're connecting them. We're building them together, what we have here. Yes, amen. Thank you. Praise God. And what he said is very important is um, uh, all of this is primarily in the Dalit community, what uh, formerly were referred to as the untouchables and that people will tell you, well, that's been uh, no longer the case. It's no longer legal. Uh, there are a lot of things that technically aren't legal but are actually practiced in society. And so it dawned on me uh, last week that we've heard reports, but we've never seen any visuals. And uh, human beings, myself included, visuals are such a blessing. And so... We have a very brief uh, two and a half minute uh, uh, visual that uh, is uh, uh, John Knox Coda, and it's his brother David that he references off of as well. This will bless you and help us this morning. Show me the men and women you're pouring your life into. That, that's the mark of your success as a pastor. I am 
Pastor John Knox Kota doing ministry in a small city called Pidugurala in the state of Andhra Pradesh, India. I thank God for giving us the opportunity and the privilege to associate with Door Church Tucson. God is blessing this ministry by all your prayers and support. Presently, there are around 900 people who are gathering for the Sunday worship service. Apart from this, there are four pastors who are working under my leadership in four different places. And I am prayerfully planning and praying to send two persons to two different places to plant churches. Last year in December, a mob of uh, Hindu religious people were attacked the church and broke sound system and some chairs and even threatened uh, our believers not to attend the church and uh, they warned us to shut the church forever. But Almighty God heard our prayers and made them calm. But even now, in lot of uh, restrictions, we are uh, gathering for the worship services. In some places, we don't have a freedom to preach and gather our living God. So please do pray about this. But we know that the one who is in us is greater than the one who is in the world. And we are the team where we wanted to die for Jesus and for the expansion of the kingdom of God. So we don't fear about all these things. We are doing the ministry in a challenging situation. Sir. Thank you so much for all your prayers in this scenario. And I thank you for all, each one of you, for uh, you know blessing this ministry with a camera. So by live, we are reaching a lot of people. Thank each and everyone. And I especially thank Pastor Harold and uh, Pastor Larry uh, for their eminent leadership for these ministries. And I thank uh, my brother, Pastor David Kota, for all his support and prayers. I am sure if you continue your prayers and uh, support for these ministries, we will send a lot of people to the unreached areas to plant the churches. And also we will win India for Jesus. Thank you. Thank you so much. Praise the Lord. So we want uh, to ask the ushers to come, and uh, uh, this is not uh, your regular tithes and offerings, but this morning's offering is to uh, send uh, Brother Larry uh, to all of these six uh, locations, and uh, I don't know how many times, I think 18 times he'll be preaching, so uh, you can, uh, there is a... Uh, on the giving app, there is a, a link for the India uh, ministry and trip. Uh, you can go to that, or you can, in your giving, designate it to, towards uh, this uh, endeavor because we're underwriting the expenses uh, along with Paul Gualteri, who's uh, helping also we're underwriting the expense of all of this, and it's worth uh, uh, obeying God in open doors that he's given us. So let's pray. Thank you for your faithfulness, uh, and we're going to believe God. Lord, we rejoice this morning in the open doors of evangelism that you grant to us. Uh, and Lord, over the years, your faithfulness... Uh, as we have tried to respond to those great and effectual doors uh, of opportunity, even uh, when opposition accompanies it, Lord, you're going to prevail. I pray a special grace on this offering today, an anointing upon uh, Brother Larry as he goes. You would protect him you will overshadow and anoint him in uh, special signs and wonders and miracles and gifts of the Holy Ghost. Uh, you will instruct him in what to preach in the laying of all important foundations uh, in these people and in these places and churches, and we thank you for it uh, in the wonderful name of Jesus, amen and amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, brother. Hello, 
and welcome to Door Church. My name is Michaela, and whether you're joining us in person or online, we're so glad you can make it. We're going to take a few minutes to share what's coming up on our calendar. First up, in our morning service on October 8th, we're celebrating a child dedication. If your child hasn't been dedicated, this is a perfect opportunity to let us pray over you as you invite God into your parenting decisions and your child's life. Sign-ups are open now through October 1st, so go to door.church slash dedication or use a QR code in the lobby if you're interested. Following the dedication, we've planned a water baptism in the evening on October 8th. In 2 Corinthians 5-7, the Bible says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. If you've never been baptized or if you're new to Christ, baptism is a public declaration that you are taking the next step in your relationship with God and have been made new through Him. You can sign up at door.church slash baptism or scan the QR code in the lobby. Sean King here with a reminder, you still have a chance to see the best of Israel. In March of 2024, we're planning a once in a lifetime tour of the Holy Land. Registration closes December 4th and we still have a few seats available. Join us to see the history of the Old and New Testament in a whole new light. As we explore Israel and walk where Jesus walked, you can learn more info from me or Lupita Tascarella after service or head straight to door.church slash news. This Saturday, we're filling our fellowship hall with local music. Join us at 7 p.m. for a free family-friendly concert featuring Desperados and Piercing the Darkness. Our whole goal with events like this is to reach our community with the good news of Jesus. So join us at 11 a.m. for a local outreach and make sure to invite a friend. A rock and royal Christmas is coming to you this December. Each year, we're so blessed to work with your children to put on a special Christmas production. Children ages five and up are invited to join us for our first practice next Sunday, October 1st in the Children's Church. If you have any questions, find Martin and Sirius Sanchez or Tim and Kathleen Martin after service. Those are all of today's announcements. If you'd like to find more details about anything we've mentioned here or to find our full calendar of events, take a look at our app or website at door.church slash news. We hope you have a beautiful Sunday. Amen. Amen. It's good to see everyone this morning. I uh, bring greetings just having returned from El Paso and ministering in uh, Pastor Stevens Church there. We had a tremendous time in revival last week. Uh, we had 31 saved and 18 filled with the Holy Spirit in just the five days of ministry. And man, that is fruit to your account. And uh, we're always so grateful for the opportunities God allows us to minister on your behalf as a mother church. And uh, it's such a great privilege for us to be a part of what God is doing in the world. I'm excited to see and hear reports uh, back from India when Pastor Larry comes back and exciting to see what God is doing there. Amen. Let's turn in our Bibles to 1 John chapter 2. Sermon today is the final message in a series we've been doing on human sexuality. I'm glad to finally be bringing it to a close because I have about six other sermons that I want to preach on uh, different subjects, and so I wanted to kind of close the series off this evening as we've been looking at what the Bible says about bringing clarity out of confusion. A couple of weeks ago, I ministered on the aggressive LGBTQI agenda and talked about separating the agenda from the individual. And no matter how aggressive the agenda may be, uh, we must never lose sight of the individuals that have been caught up in that agenda. We, as a congregation, as believers, we minister to the individual as those who are on a mission to rescue the perishing. And so this morning, I want to close it off by talking about love and not talking about love in some random way, but true love as the Word of God describes it. And I've entitled this message uh, from a popular slogan of today, and that is love is love, but I have titled it as a question, love is love. And so we're going to look at this because in, in America we have created a civil religion called expressive individualism. And it means that uh, I answer to no one but myself. And uh, I am the higher power that I am accountable to. It means that I am autonomous. 
and I govern myself, I'm independent, and um, as one man described it, he said, the value of autonomous individualism maintains that each person is independent in terms of destiny and accountability. Ultimate moral authority is self-generated, and in the end, we answer to no one but ourselves, for we are truly on our own. Our choices are solely ours, determined by our personal pleasure and not by any higher moral authority. And I think the way that we have seen this manifested today is in a generation that has abandoned the truth in the name of love. Love with the absence of truth and the deeper question that we're going to explore this morning from the Word of God, is it possible to have love without the truth? So let's turn to 1 John chapter 2. <clears throat> verse 15 uh, this morning. Do not love the world, nor the things it offers you. For when you love the world, you do not have the love of the Father in you. For the world offers only a craving for physical pleasure, a craving for everything we see, and pride in our achievements and possessions. These are not from the Father, but are from this world. And this world is fading away, along with everything that people crave. But anyone who does what pleases God will live forever. And we're going to skip down to chapter 4, and we're going to look at verse 7 through 10, just a couple pages over. Dear friends, let us continue to love one another, for love comes from God. Anyone who loves is a child of God and knows God, but anyone who does not love does not know God, for God is love. God showed how much he loved us by sending his one and only son into the world so that we might have eternal life through him. This is real love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as a sacrifice to take away our sins. I want to begin this morning by examining the brilliant uh, demonic strategy in advancing the LGBTQ plus agenda in people's thinking over the last 50 years. It's first, it first advanced uh, its cause by attaching itself to the civil rights movement. And the argument came that I was born this way and therefore, if I am born this way, then you reject who I am born, just like the civil rights movement, then you could essentially be likened to a racist or an oppressor or in terms of the agenda's language and vocabulary, phobic. And they started coming up with rights, that uh, we have rights, they are gay rights, and, and, uh, and then they expanded the... LGB alphabet uh, into uh, in infinity, I guess. I don't know. Uh, there's only 26 letters, but one of them is going to represent something uh, at some point in life. And so that happened as it was attached to the civil rights agenda, but then something else happened. And this is where I think the real coup took place, and that is the power of controlling the narrative. And suddenly it went from talking about rights and it shifted to being all about love. And the idea that love is love. Now this is extremely to navigate, uh, extremely difficult to navigate because who's against love? Everybody wants love, everybody wants to be loved and so what kind of evil person are you if you are against love? But what's more important to me is what are the origins of this slogan that people have attached their lives to, this love is love? Where did it come from? Because ideas have consequences. And so if you're going to attach your life to an idea, you should know the origin of that idea. It might be helpful. It all started back in 2013 when American actress Maria Bello wrote a New York Times article, which she later expanded into a book in 2015, and the title of the book was, Whatever, Love is Love. 
with a subtitle, Questioning the Labels We Give Ourselves. And she was in the beginning parts, as she writes, of a same-sex relationship with her then best friend, Claire Munn, and her 12-year-old son uh, from a previous uh, relationship started to notice something fishy going on with his mom and she was hiding things and he could kind of tell something was, uh, something romantic was stirring somewhere, but he couldn't quite put his finger on it. And so he's asking her, mom, are you hiding something from me? And you know, what's going on? And, and so listen to this well-written summation of, of this conversation she had with her son. So the actress has a 12-year-old son, Jackson, and from her former relationship with Dan McDermott, and she says she struggled with how to tell her only child about her relationship with a woman. This was the moment I had been anticipating and dreading for months, says Bello, of when her son asked if there was something she wasn't telling him. I took a deep breath, knowing that my answer and his response would have an impact on our lives for a very long time. He was right. I was with someone romantically and I hadn't told him. I'd become involved with a woman who was my best friend and as it happens, a person who is like a godmother to my son. But when Bello made this decision to finally tell her son about her relationship, she was surprised by his response and she writes this. He looked at me for what seemed like an eternity and then broke into a huge warm smile, she said. Mom, love is love, whatever you are. And he said this with wisdom beyond his years, she said. So what we find is that the origins of the idea that love is love came from a 12-year-old boy. I have nothing against 12-year-old boys, but I've been around enough of them to know they did, don't exa- they're not exactly oozing wisdom. They don't even have life experience to know what wisdom is yet. And now years later, this has taken on a cultural normalization. Everyone just accepts it. Love is love. But it's probably not a good idea to build your life on a slogan that is created by a prepubescent 12-year-old boy especially when it is a circular definition in itself. You can't define love by just saying it's love. But what is love? Well, love is love. Love has to be defined or or else it becomes nothing at all. Or it just becomes anything, which in turn makes it nothing. That there's no value to love if there's no definition of love. It's like Matt Walsh's documentary, uh, brilliant documentary, if you uh, haven't seen it, called What is a Woman? And he goes around and he's just asking all these professors and teachers and people that are teaching college students and he's asking them a simple question, what is a woman? What is a woman? And yet over and over again, the professors and politicians alike struggled to answer This very simple question, what is a woman? And they just kept repeating stuff like, well, a woman is a woman. You know, a woman. Yeah, but what is a woman? You can't define woman by just saying it's a woman. Something defines what a woman is. And in the same reality we're looking at when it comes to human sexuality, something defines what love is. Love doesn't define itself. To say that love is love is just you're going in circles, and that's why there is so much confusion surrounding the subject of love. When it comes to same-sex relationships, they begin to control the narrative that it's all about love. It's not about behavior. Like a master magician, don't look over here at the behavior of homosexuality. Just focus on the idea of two people in love. How can you be against love? They're in love. They can't, you can't help who you fall in love with. They push this narrative in countless 
measures through social media influence and movies and TV shows. And it's, it's all too familiar, the story, you know, the person suddenly becomes aware of their uh, sexuality, uh, they embrace it as their true identity, and then they begin to live it out, and suddenly they're just free, and they're just so happy, and all the restrictions of life have been pulled off of them, and then they find their true love. They're expressing their true selves. It's the same story over and over and over again. It's the same narrative being pushed because they're shifting the focus from behavior to love. Let's just talk about love. Don't look at the behavior of it. Just focus on love. You can't be against love. So that complicates things because many of us are caught up in the narrative that love is love. That, hey, how can you argue with love? You can't help who you fall in love with. And not only that, but we have, uh, it's also true that nearly everyone here this morning, you know and you love someone who lives openly in the LGB community. You know and you love them. They are friends, they are cousins, they are brothers, they are sons, they are daughters. And this complicates things for a believer as we've been studying through the word of God because the truth of God's word begins to slap love in the face, the world's idea of love in the face. And we're confronted with this. But it's not these things alone that just explain the pronounced shift in public sentiment. The reality is that same-sex relationships don't radically depart from modern morality. That it's much in line with contemporary mores, and this is one of the reasons why uh, Gen Z and younger generations find these things easier to embrace, because it's not just propaganda of the media, but it's a natural outgrowth of what they already think love and sexuality to be about. And what do they believe? They believe that love is God. Love is God. Therefore, truth must submit to love. Or love becomes truth. Whatever love is, that is my truth. But the word of God has a completely different message. Same three words in a different order. The world says love is God, but God says God is love. And there's a big difference between embracing love is God or God is love. Love is defined according to the word of God. It's not some arbitrary concept. God is love. Not only that, but God showed what real love is. He demonstrated it to us in verse 9. God showed how much he loved us by sending his one and only son into the world so that we might have eternal life through him. That true love is defined by God and it is connected to a very important truth. And that truth has to confront us before the love can be embraced by us. What is that truth? Verse 10, this is real love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as a sacrifice to take away our sins. See, love is connected to that. The truth is that God loves us, but our sin separates us from him. That he wants us to be able to embrace his love, but in order to do that, we have to be confronted with the truth of our sin. That Jesus came as a sacrifice, a demonstration of God's love to take away our sins so that we can live in the love of God. But culture is abandoning the truth In the name of love, they are making the dark exchange we began this series with in Romans 1, 25. They exchange the truth of God for a lie. You know, the most basic idea of truth is that which corresponds with reality. If I tell you right now, it's raining outside. All you have to do is go outside and look and see if it's raining or not. In other words, the truth of it's raining outside corresponds with what is real. 
that it's actually raining. If I tell you it's raining and you go outside and it's not raining, it's a lie. I haven't spoken the truth. I have spoken a lie because truth is that which corresponds with reality. It either is raining or it's not raining. That's the idea of truth. Not what you think is true, not what you want to be true, but what actually is objectively true. James Emery White says God is truth. He's the source of all truth. This means truth is transcendent. Truth doesn't come from us. It isn't made up or determined by us, but rather comes to us. That's why we speak of the Bible as God's revelation. It's God revealing himself and truth about himself that could not otherwise be known. This is a radical idea. Truth is not something we create. It is something we discover. Truth is, and we simply discover it. It's not a guessing game. It's not some subjective art. Truth matters, but today truth is being readily abandoned because of something else that culture says is more important than truth, and that is love. James Emery Wright continues, and he says, here's the way the dynamic is meant to play out. The love we are meant to express cannot be separated from the truth we are meant to embrace. You cannot have the love without the truth, just as you cannot have the truth without the love. No application of love, if it's truly love, can be at the expense of truth. If you feel love is calling you to abandon or turn a blind eye toward truth, then you are misunderstanding the proper application and demonstration of love. See, love does not stand alone. It is intrinsically connected to truth. That is why Paul says in Philippians chapter 1, verse 9, this is my prayer that your love, he's talking about love, that your love may more and more overflow in what? In fullness of knowledge and depth of discernment. See how love is connected. He doesn't even go and just say, I want your love to overflow. How does he want your love to overflow? Because it's connected with, uh, with knowledge, it's connected with truth, and it is connected with a depth of discernment. That love is not just something you just accept. It can be shown up, it can be tried against truth, and it can be found to be true or not. 1 John chapter 3, verse 10, that explains that there is a moral dimension to love. He says, so now we can tell who are children of God and who are children of the devil. Anyone who does not live righteously and does not love other believers does not belong to God. He says, there's a very clear way that you can tell who belongs to God. People who are living righteously and loving other believers, they belong to God. There is a truth and love that are connected together. And this is the overwhelming truth that we find in God's word, but yet people are still looking to love. You can even consider our culture's confessional statement, and I think these thoughts permeate our culture. They will say, God made me this way. He wouldn't deny me my natural desires. God wouldn't deny me love. God loves everyone. And by the way, I don't have to explain myself to you or anyone else. Those ideas permeate our culture's thinking, and this deception is at work even in Christians. I'm still saved. I still believe in Jesus. You know, years ago, Rick Riley, who, is, uh, who was at the time an ESPN sports columnist, wrote an article about the football coach, an assistant football coach at Nebraska named Ron Brown. And Ron Brown had made some very direct statements about homosexuality as a sin and the need for people to repent of their sin and come to Christ. And uh, Rick Riley went out and he's investigating, he's going around and he finds this young man named Brett Major and listen to how he describes him. He says his family has been Nebraska season ticket holders forever. He was a high school basketball player in Omaha, a 4.0 plus student. Man of the year there and at Texas Christian University, student body vice president in Phi Beta Kappa and a hanger of a big red Nebraska flag in his room and he's gay. Oh, and he's a devout Christian, thanks to Ron Brown himself. So it turns out that Ron Brown had gone to his school when he was 12 years old 
And Ron Brown began uh, preaching the gospel in that school. And this young man, Brett Major, lifted his hand, wanted to give his life to Christ. And he's describing it. And he, he's saying that he was looking at, their, uh, at this man, this assistant coach in Nebraska. And he loved Nebraska football. And this is what he admired so much. Uh, and he idolized anything in Nebraska football. And he said to himself, wow, he's cool. And he's a Nebraska football, uh, he, and he's Nebraska football, and he believes in God. And that's all it took for me, he said. He gives his life to Christ, and then he says, this was a milestone for me. I decided I want to live a Christian life from that moment on. So he's 12 years old. So now he is uh, about 10 years later. Rick Riley finds this young man who is a, a proclaiming Christian that is living a homosexual lifestyle, and Rick finds him so that he could, you know, get those quotes and stuff that uh, writers like to get. And so he asks him, can you respond to the idea that the same man who led you to the Lord a, a decade ago is now declaring that if you don't repent of your sins, you're going to go to hell? And Major says, I couldn't care less. He said, I know God doesn't make a mistake. He didn't put me on this earth to be banished to hell. And I don't have to report to Ron Brown at the pearly gates. This is very true, Brett. I will say. You are not going to report to Coach Brown, but you're going to report to your creator on judgment day. It won't be a, it won't be a coach of a Nebraska football. It won't be the man who led you to the Lord. You're going to be accountable for how you have lived your life and how you have lined up your life with God's word. He's already spoken on these things and you will be held accountable for the truth that is in his word. Not the truth that you want to believe, not how you feel, not what you think is the good idea or a better idea than God. We will all be held accountable to God's word. And the word of God is blatantly ignored in the name of love so that the lifestyle can be adjusted. And we can justify how we're walking. God's love promises to us a better script. And that is that we can walk in truth and in love. The Bible promises us the ability to walk in victory. And our glorious God declares through the Apostle Paul, as we looked at in the past week, such were some of you. It is a declaration of independence from your life of sin, of independence from the truth that is separating you from God, an ability to embrace the truth of God's word and to find salvation and redemption by the blood of Jesus Christ. You know, there's an interesting little nugget that we find when the Apostle Paul writes to the church at Philippi in Philippians chapter 2, verse 25. He says, meanwhile, I thought I should send Epaphroditus back to you. He is a true brother, co-worker, and fellow soldier, and he was your messenger to help me in my need. You know what was interesting about this is the name Epaphrodites means honored by Aphrodite. Aphrodite is the goddess of sex. That is who they would worship in Corinth. That was the temple with the thousand prostitutes that would come down and entice the city of Corinth to come and worship in sexual prostitution. And his, he was named, honored by Epaphrodite. His parents were devoted pagans. They were devoted to the house of Aphrodite and it speaks of his upbringing and it speaks of a former lifestyle, but now he has been washed, he has been sanctified and he has become a committed follower of Christ and listen to the Apostle Paul's view of Epaphrodites and his command to the church at Philippi. He says, welcome him in the Lord's love and with great joy and give him the honor that people like him deserve. I mean, if you can imagine, I'm sending Epaphrodites to you. As soon as they said that, to us, it's just a name. To them, they would understand immediately, honored by Aphrodite? This is the guy you're sending to us? What do you, why would you send us this guy? I mean, we're, we're honoring Jesus Christ. <laughs> he didn't even try to change his name or adjust it. It's a testimony, and such were some of you. It's a testimony of somebody who's been washed and changed and brought into the family of God by the blood of Jesus Christ. 
This is the reality of following Jesus that all of us face, no matter the sin or temptations we face, that his love confronts our truth and demands we embrace his truth. Matthew 16, 24, then Jesus said to his disciples, if any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way. Take up your cross and follow me. See, discipleship can be hard. You have to take up your cross, whatever it may be. You have to struggle against your flesh. You have to crucify your flesh and your desires. You have to fight and you have to resist temptation. No matter what area or what arena that temptation comes to you. What form it comes to you in. We all must crucify our flesh. Whatever struggles you are facing that is against the truth of God's word, whatever temptation that the devil is crafting according to your desires, you must fight that. You must resist it. You must take up your cross and follow Jesus. Colin Hansen said, for presidents and paupers, gays and straights, there is no other way to true happiness than the one Jesus traveled. The way that ended in the agony of the cross and the ecstasy of resurrection To deny ourselves is to welcome the God who delights in giving every good and perfect gift, especially freedom from the vain pursuit of self-fulfillment. My message through this series, as Pastor Warner and I have put it together over the course of the last 18 months and taught it in AO and, and on our college campus and here over these last nine messages If I could sum it all up for you, I would say that this can be the finest hour of the church. That the times we're living in, as dark as they may seem, as confusing as they may be, the word of God has the ability to bring clarity in the midst of confusion. I read a great article that came out a couple weeks ago by James Emery White, and it was called, It's Time for a New Finest Hour. And it was about the post-Christian nature of the Western world that we live in today. It was prompted by an article he said that he read in the Times, which is a leading UK newspaper. And they had conducted a survey of the Church of England clerics and uh, the priests and the uh, deacons, etc., from the Church of England. They, this claimed to be the largest such survey in almost a decade. And the result of this survey was that three quarters of the Church of England priests, three quarters, so 75% of the priests of the Church of England believe that Britain can no longer be described as a Christian country. But what the shocking part was for me as I read through this was the reason they gave for the decline. Why, in other words, they're saying, why is Britain no longer a Christian country? They're trying to give up reasons why. And it says this, the survey found, quote, found a strong desire among rank and file priests for significant changes in the church doctrine on issues such as sex, sexuality, marriage, and the role of women to bring it into greater line with public opinion. In other words, a majority of priests want, quote, to start conducting same-sex weddings and drop the church's opposition to premarital and gay sex. And they also felt under pressure. Why did they feel under pressure? As one priest put it, the pressure of justifying the Church of England's position in increasingly secular and skeptical audiences. Linda Woodhead was a professor, is a professor, and the head of the Department of Theology and Religious Studies at King's College in London. And she was noting that the survey revealed how the church had found itself in recent decades. And she said it was, it's been pushed apart from public opinion on what's right and wrong. In other words, the church and public opinion used to have the same opinions or very similar opinions. And now the church's opinion is way over here and the public's opinion is way over here. And referring to the moderate ground, the frontline priests seem to be staking out or at least wanting to. Woodhead added that if they were listened to, the church might be in a better place today. So what she's saying is that if the church would just simply come closer to public's opinion 
on sex and sexuality, on same-sex marriage, if the church would move closer to the opinion of the culture, then the church would grow again, would become more popular because they're more accepting and therefore more people would come into the church. In other words, we as a church should be changing with the culture so that we remain accepted. There was one man who had a bit of sanity in all of this. His name is Reverend Nick Baines. He's the Bishop of Leeds. And he responded to the survey in brilliant fashion. He said, the church is the church, and as such, not a club. It has a distinct vocation that does not include seeking popularity. This means sometimes going against the flow of popular culture, however uncomfortable that may be. See, there's a temptation to think that if we just softened our message, if we just compromise the word of God, or, or at least don't preach on these things, and for God's sake, don't preach nine sermons on human sexuality. I mean, mention it a little bit in one sermon, kind of winking a little bit, just kind of, you know, just kind of pass over it quickly. Uh, if we would do that, uh, especially when it came to sex and sexuality, maybe we would start to see the church grow uh, because we're more accept accepting of, of society. But Thomas Merton once warned against the watering down of the Christian faith to such a degree that we have nothing to offer the world that doesn't already have. If you're not careful, we water down the message of the gospel and dilute it so much that it's the same thing the world is offering. And we have nothing that we are standing out as salt and light and truth. We are in called to embody the message of Jesus who came bearing grace and truth. John 1.14, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son who came from the father, full of grace and truth. How did he do this? He brought grace to speak truth so that people could enter his love. If you just think about it, the woman at the well. He meets the woman at the well. She had been divorced five times uh, and she's living in sexual immorality. She's living with a man she's not married to uh, and she's met by Jesus with radical acceptance. He went out of his way to go to the well that day in the middle of the day to have an appointment with this woman who's a five-time divorcee, this woman who's now living with a man who's not her husband. Uh, she is living in sin. She is fornicating. She's living in immorality. And he meets this woman with radical acceptance. And yet, at the same time, she was confronted with the truth of her sexual promiscuity. Give me this living water. Oh, 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 okay. You want the love that I'm giving? Go get your husband. You want to embrace, you want to be embraced by my love and embrace my love? That's fine. But first, I brought you the grace and now I'm bringing you the truth. And the truth is that you cannot live in my love until you embrace my truth. Jesus came full of grace. And truth, go call your husband. And he begins to deal with her sexual immorality. And when she embraces that truth, her life is changed forever. You could think about the woman who was brought to Jesus, caught in the very act of adultery, and they throw her down at Jesus' feet, and they say, Jesus, this woman was caught in the very act of adultery, and our uh, law says that she has to be stoned stoned to death. The world was condemning her, but grace found her at her lowest. Jesus protected her from these men. Jesus protected her. And then he commanded her to do what? To leave her life of sin. He brought grace, and then he brought truth, and he said, go and sin no more. That for you to fully embrace and live in my love, you must embrace my truth. This is grace 
and truth. What the world needs is Jesus. What the world needs is Jesus' ministry being preached and being shared in your workplace and in your school. They need to experience the grace of God and the truth of his word. It's this combination that made Jesus so compelling. But somehow today, the church world has lost this dynamic. We either confront the world with an abusive spirit or we water things down in the name of goodwill. And neither of these will engage a post-Christian world at the point of their deepest need. See, what the world needs is Jesus, and Jesus brings grace and truth. And what I'm declaring to you is that this is the church's moment to take a stand, not to compromise, not to shrink back. This could be the church's finest hour. On June 18, 1940, Winston Churchill addressed the House of Commons as to the rationale for continuing to fight the war against Hitler and his prediction that the Battle of Britain was about to begin. And we've listened to his concluding words. He says this, upon this battle depends the survival of Christian civilization. Upon it depends our own British life and the long continue, uh, continuity of our institutions and our empire. The whole fury and might of the enemy must very soon be turned on us. Hitler knows that he will have to break us in this island or lose the war. If we can stand up to him, all Europe may be free and the life of the world may move forward into broad, sunlit uplands. But if we fail, then the whole world, including the United States, including all that we have known and cared for, will sink into the abyss of a new dark age made more sinister and perhaps more protracted by the lights of perverted science. Let us therefore brace ourselves to our duties and so bear ourselves that if the British Empire and its commonwealth last for a thousand years, men will say this was their finest hour. I'm telling you there is an assault of the enemy that has come against the church, that has come against our God. This is the time for the church to stand and be what we were called to be, the pillar and the ground of truth. And not just to declare that truth, but to declare that truth in grace. This time we're not resisting Hitler and his armies from advancing in world war, but rather we are fighting for the very eternities that are facing men and women as spiritual beings. We are fighting for eternal souls. And this is the moment where we can stand and become our finest hour, not to shrink back, to, but to press forward in grace and truth. I want to ask you to bow your heads this morning, every head bowed, every eye closed for just a couple of minutes as we take some time to pray. Nobody looking around for just a couple of minutes. There are people here this morning. You've come and you are visiting with us. It's your first time in our church and we're very grateful that you've joined us this morning. We, we welcome you and we thank you for taking the time to come. You're not here this morning though by accident. You're not here just by some circumstance that... You know, you accidentally showed up or popped up or I would even declare to you it wasn't even just a random thought you had. I'll just go to church. What I'm declaring to you this morning is that God has a divine appointment for you this morning. And that divine appointment is that the truth of his word would come and meet you at the point of your need You've come this morning struggling in life, struggling against who knows what. You feel like your feet are stuck in the mud sometimes and you can't get them out like quicksand. It's something just keeps pulling you down and you struggle to get up and it seems to make you worse, put you in a worse position and in a worse place. It's like you've become a slave, a slave to your own desires. You, you want to quit things. You want to change your lifestyle. You want to be a better man, a better woman. And you make decisions and you try and you try and you try, but on your own, you just keep falling short. You keep falling short. 
the message of the Word of God, the message of God to you, is that the reason for all of your struggles and all of your pain and all of the circumstances that you're facing in life, the reason for that is because you were created to have a relationship with your Father in heaven, with your Creator in heaven. But your sin separates you from that relationship. Your sin is your disobedience. It's your rebellion. It's, it's saying to God, you know what, God? I don't care what your word says. I'm going to live the way I want to live. And the Bible says all of us have sinned and all of us have fallen short of the glory of God. Not one of us are righteous. No, not one. Every single person here this morning has fallen short of the glory of God. No matter what we try to do, no matter how we try to earn our way back to God, well, I'll just have more good deeds than bad deeds. I'll just do more right than wrong. But things aren't weighed on the scales in eternity. It's very simple. And that is that God loved you so much that he gave his only begotten son to die on a cross for your sins. You and I deserve to be judged for our own sin. I deserve to be judged for my sin. You deserve to be judged for your sin. But God loves you so much that he said, you know what? Instead of you having to bear the judgment of your own sin, I will bear it for you. 2,000 years ago, he sent his son, Jesus Christ, the precious lamb of God who was slain on a cross. All the sins of humanity, past, present, and future, your sins and my sins placed upon him that day. And he was crucified. He was judged for my sins, for your sins, so that we could believe in him and not perish, but have everlasting life. I'm not just talking about getting your your life together right now for the next 30 years or 40 years. I'm talking about eternal life. That's what God offers you. That's what God has demonstrated for you, his love. And you've been looking for love and you've been trying to find it in relationships and acceptance and all kinds of things. You keep falling short and the message of grace and truth is coming here this morning that no matter what lifestyle you're in, no matter what sin you find yourself in this morning, God loves you and he already made the first move. And now he's asking you, will you make a move towards me? I've sent my son. I've demonstrated my love for you. Now will you come and receive my son as a sacrifice in your place so that your sins can be forgiven? You're here this morning while every head is bowed, every eye is closed. You say, Pastor, I'm not right with God. There's sin in my life. I'm well aware of that. I've become a slave to my own sin. I'm fighting it. I'm resisting it. But I'm making matters worse. This morning, I want to surrender to Jesus Christ so that he can be my Lord and Savior. If that's you this morning, while every head is bowed, every eye is closed, and there are many of you this morning, God is speaking to you. He's drawing you unto himself. If that's you, would you just lift up your hand while every head is bowed, every eye is closed? Just lift it up quickly and say, Pastor, that's me. I'm not right with God. I'm not right with God this morning, but I want to get right with God. Just lift it up quickly. God bless you, sir. God bless you, young man. Who else? Just lift it up. God is dealing with many, many hearts here this morning. God is ministering to you. He's drawing you unto himself. He is giving you an opportunity to have eternal life and to experience his love in its purest form. Every head is bowed, every eye is closed. You say, Pastor, I'm not right with God, but I want to get right with God this morning. Just lift up your hand all across this place. Lift it up quickly before we change the call, before we change the order of the service and we move on to other things. This is a critical moment. God bless you over here. God bless you over here. Who else? Just lift it up quickly. Lift it up high where I could see it. Yes, God bless you. God bless you over here. God bless you. Who else? There's others. There's others. There's people here this morning. You have walked away from God. You have ran away from God. You have pursued your own desires. And you are now, uh, 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 you are now living in the destruction of your own sin. Because you left God. And you turned from his love. You've backslidden and now this morning God in his grace has reached out to you and he's calling you back to himself and you say, Pastor, I want to get right with God this morning. Just lift up your hand all across this place. Who else? Lift it up quickly. God bless you. 
God bless you over here. Who else? Just lift it up. Anybody else? Every one of you that lifted your hand. Every one of you that lifted your hand. I want you to do something else. I want you to stand to your feet right where you're at. Just quickly stand up. Quickly. Quickly over here. Stand up. Stand up over here. Quickly. Just stand up to your feet. Uh, God bless you. God bless you. Would you make your way to the aisle? I want you to come to the front here. Somebody's going to come with you and pray. Just come. Just come quickly. Come out to the aisle. There's many people coming. There's others. Uh, uh, you need to respond. There's others. You didn't lift up your hand, but you want to get right with God. Would you come out of your seat and just come and meet me down here at the front? There's going to be somebody to pray with you. There's a young lady here this morning. Even as I was preaching, there's something stirring in your heart. You want so badly to be loved. And you've been looking for love in all the wrong places and it's destroyed you. But you're ashamed, you're afraid, I don't want to answer right now. I don't know what are people going to think. Who cares what people are going to think? God is offering you the purest love you will ever experience in your life. And God is ministering to you. He's drawing you to himself. I want you to get out of your seat, young lady. And I want you to come and find a place to pray. Somebody is going to lead you in a prayer of repentance. And you're going to experience forgiveness for your sins. Uh, your heart is going to be right with God this morning. Just come out of your seat and come and find a place to pray this morning. Church, the challenge through this entire series, the challenge for us as a church can this be our finest hour? We stand out from all the world when we speak the truth and grace. When we minister Jesus, that's what this world needs. They don't need people with an abusive spirit. They don't need a watered down gospel. They need to be met with a radical grace and then spoken a radical truth that demands repentance, that calls them into the love of God. We need to make sure that we're on the right side of this. We need to make sure that our hearts are right and say, God, I don't know. I, sometimes these things are so hard. The world makes it so confusing. I started talking about love and I have friends and I, yeah, but you know what? What about the truth of God's word? That's what we must line our lives up with. Stay in the love of God. Embrace the truth of God. Bring the truth of God, by the grace of God, to everybody that you come into contact with. I want to open these altars this morning. I want you to come and find a place to pray. Could God burden your heart even further for the souls of this world? Could God burden your heart uh, for those people that are around you, uh, that you that are so desperate uh, in every kind of lifestyle that you could bring the gospel with grace and truth and bring a Jesus ministry to their lives? I can't bring a Jesus ministry if I don't speak the truth. I can't bring a Jesus ministry if I don't do it in grace. If I don't bring the love of the Father, let's come and find a place to pray this morning as we sing this song and worship God. Oh, 
that I can forgive Here I stand Knowing that I'm your desire Sanctified Sanctified by glory is mine since you laid down your life the greatest sacrifice Just as I am, empty-handed but alive in Your hands. We're singing, man. Yeah. Oh Lord, we sing, Majesty. Forever I am changed. Forever I am changed by Your love. In the presence of your majesty. This morning, Father, we glorify you, Lord. We magnify your name, Lord. God, we worship you, Lord, that your grace has found us, Lord. God, we thank you, Lord, that our sins are forgiven, Lord. Washed in the blood of Jesus. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Jesus, for dying for our sins. We thank you, Lord God. You are gracious and you are true, Lord God. We thank God for his word that brings clarity, even in the midst of confused world. Man, we want to uh, dismiss this morning. Uh, we have got just a couple of announcements. It was uh, Tim Mason, not Tim Martin, who needs prayer for healing. Tim Martin did not make his way to Saudi Arabia this last week, and so... We'll pray for, <laughs> pray for Tim Mason um, as well. And um, uh, Pastor Mike will be ministering this evening as part of our evening service, 7 o'clock. 
Prayer is at 6 o'clock. You come, lay a hold of God. And then Wednesday night, we have Pastor Smith ministering the word of God to us uh, on a Wednesday night. So that's going to be great in the middle of the week. We also have uh, Pastor Pakia Raj, who is uh, the leader of our churches in India. He's going to be ministering next Sunday, both morning and evening. And so that's going to be an exciting time as well as we look ahead uh, to that. Amen. And then I just wanted to let you know, um, I know for this offering for India that you may have to arrange some things. We're going to leave that option on the app open till Saturday. So even if you need to arrange some things, uh, uh, we'll, we'll, you can give to that offering up until Saturday. Uh, or if you want to put something in the plate next Sunday, just make sure you mark it for India. That will be a great blessing for all that God is doing there. Men, our heads are bowed. Pastor Lamont, would you lift your voice and dismiss us in prayer this morning? Thank you for joining us online. If you gave your life to Jesus today, we just want to say congratulations. Follow the link in the description that says New Believers Start Here so we can connect with you and encourage you in your new faith. Through the other links in the description, you can also send our pastors prayer requests and questions. If you'd like to find more messages like today's, browse the live section of our YouTube channel. And of course, subscribe so you can see more from Door Church.